Numerical Computation, Chapter 11, Video 7. We will now look at stability condition for the explicit forward Euler time step. So before we get into that, um, we need one theoretical result for um, heat equation. This is the famous maximum principle. For the um, Dirichlet homogeneous boundary condition, the case we have here, the maximum principle um, takes the following form. So the exact solution U of the heat equation satisfies the following. For any given time T2 and T1, where T2 is bigger than T1, so T2 is a later time and T1 is an early time, I have the following. The temperature distribution at a later time for any x is bounded above by the maximum temperature at time t1, where y goes through from 0 to 1, that means your whole x domain, and is bounded below by the minimum of uh, the temperature at early time t1, where y goes from 0 to 1 through the whole x domain. So what does it say? Well, it says that the maximum and minimum here shall be bounded by the maximum here and the minimum at an earlier time. So as time goes, the heat distribution is going to get flatter and flatter, and it will never form new local max or min. So we can formulate um, this maximum principle in a different way, we can say that the one here, condition here, will immediately imply the following. That is, if I look at the maximum of u at a later time t2 over all x, that maximum shall be bounded by the maximum of u at an early time t1 when x maximum taking x going between 0 and 1. Okay? So, at a later time t2, the maximum of this absolute value of u has to be non-increasing. Okay, so you can say the maximum value of u tx over x now becomes a function of t. This is a non-increasing function in t. So this is a very important property for the heat equation. And if you um, approximate the heat equation by some discrete method and you have a discrete data approximation to it, you would want this principle to be preserved in your numerical approximation as well. So let's take a look at the um, discrete maximum principle. And we try to preserve the same things. That is, um, the maximum is non-increasing. Okay. So we can write it in the following way. So now we have discrete data and discrete time step. So the maximum over all j, meaning taking maximum in x, for u j n, meaning the maximum at the time step n, um, shall be an upper bound for the same maximum when you increase the time step by 1. And this shall hold for every n. So one can be convinced that this is the corresponding discrete version of the maximum principle. And now let's see, um, requiring such a maximum principle, what does it have to say to our numerical scheme? Does it preserve it or does it preserve it under certain conditions? So what we do here is to provide a sufficient condition which will guarantee the discrete maximum principle. Um, from the argument, we'll clearly see this is sufficient, and we do not show this is necessary. And in fact, this is also a necessary condition, okay? Just to mention that. Okay, so assume now we make the following assumption. We assume this number, 1 minus 2 gamma, is non-negative, which means gamma has to be less than half, recalling the definition of gamma, which is delta t over delta x squared, this says delta t has to be bounded by half delta x squared. Okay. So this condition is called the CFL stability condition. 
So under that condition, we can take the discrete heat equation, and we take absolute value sign on both sides. So we have left hand side absolute value, and I would have a right hand side with absolute value. And then I take the triangle inequality, that is, take absolute value of each term and add them up afterwards. I get something bigger, so it gives me inequality. And now again, since my assumption on one minus two gamma is non-negative, I can pull this outside the absolute value sign. And gamma is always non-negative, so this gamma comes out also. So actually, I would have this inequality. Now, um, for each term on the right-hand side, I um, replace this number by the maximum of this u can have over all different j's. Okay, so since I have j on the left-hand side, I'm change my index to i. So I replace this by the maximum it can get for any different um, x, uh, x index, the space index. Then I get something bigger, so I keep the inequality. And I do the same thing for that one. I take it to be the maximum over all space index. And I do the same thing for the last one, taking the maximum of this over any space index. Now we see that this number, this number, and this number, they are the same thing, isn't it? So this guy and this guy and this guy, they are the same. So which means these two would give me um, two gamma times that number, which exactly cancels the negative 2 gamma. So what remains on the right-hand side now is only this max times 1. Okay, so exactly equal to that. Now I have only one term on the right-hand side. So summing up, we have shown that um, the absolute value of u and plus 1 of j is bounded by the max of u and i, maximum taking over i. And this inequality holds for any j, every j, because there's no restriction on the j here. So here comes an important argument. So if this inequality holds for any j, then it will also hold for a particular j where um, the left-hand side reaches its maximum um, in the space. Okay, There will be a j where u, j, and plus 1 reaches the maximum. If I replace it by that one, the inequality still holds, because it holds for every j. Okay, So that's important, so make sure you understand that argument. OK, then what we have? So we can replace the left-hand side by the max over all j, and then on the right-hand side, we can write the index back using j. It doesn't matter. It's an index. And we have this inequality, which holds for every n. And we recognize that this is exactly the discrete maximum principle. OK, let's uh, revisit the CFL stability condition. It says that if now delta t is less than or equal to a half times delta x square, then I have the discrete maximum principle. So look at this condition. Do you think it's a okay, nice condition, or is it annoying? We see that this is a constraint of the size of your time step once you have chosen a grid size for the space, right? Once delta x is given, then you cannot choose delta t too big. So we realize that this actually puts a very strict constraint on delta t, especially when delta x is small. If you want it to be accurate, you will take delta x small. And then delta t has to be much smaller. So take, for example, if delta x is 10 to the negative 3, then the time step Delta t has to be bounded by a half times 10 to the negative 6, which means you have to take 2 million steps to reach time equals to 1. So we are now forced to take many, 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 many time steps, which will take quite some computational time, which is kind of annoying. 
So、um, next time we will look at some remedies to、um, get around this stability condition and getting some method that actually does not require this very strict condition. Okay, so hope that's useful and、uh, you are interested, and I'll see you next time.